Good evening. Every Tuesday, we bring in immigration updates at 5 p.m. Central Time, Houston. Emily, what do we have today to discuss? Today, we want to talk about the new filing fees that are taking effect on Monday that are just astronomical. It is now going to cost over $10,000 to file an H-1B that gets selected in the lottery for larger companies this year. It's not an April Fool's joke. Um, so we'll talk about those fee increases, uh, what exactly is increased and uh, who, to, who that impacts. Um, and the H-1B lottery, the filing window did close yesterday. It was extended an extra couple of days due to some glitches. So now what happens next? What When are we going to be expecting results? What does the result look like? Um, what does the process look like going forward? We're also going to be talking about people who are transitioning from EB2 into EB1C by working abroad as a manager. Either they worked abroad previously before they came to the U.S. and might now qualify for EB1C, or some people are even going abroad now to get that one year of managerial experience to be able to come back and uh, transition into the EB1C category. Lastly, we'll talk about changing status from H1B to B2, uh, which is a great safety net for people who, um, you know, unfortunately are terminated or lose their position when they're on H1B and the 60 day grace period is just not enough time to find the new employer and get the H1B transfer filed. So filing fees, over $10,000 uh, Before I go in, so I, I, there's some mistake uh, uh, from uh, my business partner's side. Uh, first of all, I just want to let you know that April 1st is we are going to be um, completing our 27 years on April 1st of 1997. We have started this law firm and by this April 1st, it's going to be uh, 27 years. Uh, thank you for all your support and everything. And Emily joined us a little bit later after I started, though, but uh, she's been an integral part, has been a bus good business partner of me. And uh, but I, I do apologize for the mistake Emily has done. Um, it's not 10,000, more than 10,000. I think so she meant to say it's more or something wrong with you. I'm sorry, say that again. It, the, the video. Uh, I, I, I right just want to apologize that. on behalf of you for a clerical error saying that the filing fees is $11,000. I think so it should be some $1,100 and you made it $11,000. <laughs> I wish, no, it's $11,000. Are you sure? an extra zero. <laughs> okay, $11,000. Well, you know, that $11,000 figure that you said, $11,160 is some very odd filing case which we normally don't do that much, which is called I-526, when we file the immigrant petition who are already filthy rich people who, who invest about $800,000, but it probably is not anyway closer by for the H-1B people. Is it right, Emily? No, it is that expensive. For H-1B H1 also, it crosses 10000 Emily? Yep. Okay, explain it. Explain the filing fees, Emily, for the H-1Bs. Uh, for the consulting companies normally with 50 plus employees with some restrictions that are there. What is the filing fees for the H-1P alone if they are filing in the lottery right now in premium processing, which most probably people will choose for it. Yeah, so we have a base filing fee um, that was $460. It's now going up to $780 for H-1B specifically. Each visa type now has its own separate base filing fee for an I-129 petition, which never happened before. Then we have an extra $1,500. Uh, that's the Acquia fee, um, which is used for training US workers. Uh, that's been around for 20 odd years. Then we have an extra $500 fraud fee for uh, FDNS site visits, funding all of these fraud detection activities. And then for consulting companies where they have more than 50 employees and more than 50% of their workforce is on H or L visas, they have to pay an extra $4,000. Um, that's been around, gosh, 10 years. I know it's come and go a couple of times, but it's in its current form, another $4,000. Now we have a new fee for employers that are larger than 25 employees that have to pay $600 with every single I-129. Um, to cover the asylum program. Oh, and well, then well, lastly, well, our guests are not applying <laughs> asylum. Did you? Right. Oh, oh, my guests are not applying asylum only. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, this is a new tactic of USCIS as part of their fee uh, regulation is to start having U.S. businesses now cover the cost of the asylum program because they have the ability to pay it, uh, which I don't know if I would agree on all businesses. But um, yeah, so we're adding an extra $600 there and then um, premium processing, which is practically mandatory nowadays because processing times are terrible. We need to get the H-4 and we need to get the H-4 EAD approved together in a timely manner. So that is $2,805 because that went up previous, uh, recently from $2,500. That's not even counting dependents. Um, if you need to add an H-4 for your spouse, that's an extra $470. And then if your spouse needs an H-4 EAD, that's another $520. Um, so we're definitely climbing the charts with these astronomical fees. And there's no guarantee that we're gonna get any better service. Uh, this is just for the bare minimum. So what you're telling Emily is for the H-1B and H-4 and EAD, it's more than $11,160? Yep. Holy moly. And just H-1B alone, it's $10,185 simply for the first time filing. Yep. Doesn't count legal fees either. Well, that doesn't count legal fees. I wish <laughs> our legal fees was anywhere closer right. like that. I remember Emily, I mean, my legal fees used to be a lot more than the filing fees because when I started the office in 1997, in April 1st, the filing fees at that point of time was $85, Emily. And I see that that your total uh, came out to, which they used to adjudicate the applications in two to three weeks in 1997. And you are telling that the premium processing, which takes two to three weeks to adjudicate, is ten thousand one hundred and eighty-five dollars. So there are three extra digits added to the eighty-five dollars I used to pay as a filing fees in nineteen ninety-seven on April first when we started the office assembly. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. In twenty-seven years, fees increased over a hundred times. I really don't think that's inflation. Uh, I checked into the inflation, Emily, the inflation uh, in 1997. Uh, it went to this is called usinflationcalculator.com. I looked into 1997, $85 is right now $164.35, just about 93%, Emily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there is a lawsuit that was filed. Um, on Monday, I think, to try to block this. They uh, have a temporary restraining order, so we might see an injunction if the judge agrees that this should not go into effect. So things are kind of in limbo uh, because at the same time that we have this fee increase, we also have new versions of the I-129 form and the I-140 form. Oh yeah, we haven't talked about the I-140 yet that also has an extra 300 or $600 for the asylum fee. Um, uh, but uh, so we have a new version of the form, we have new fees, and then for I-129s, there's a new location of filing. All of that's happening on April 1st, with some of these being based on when the petition is postmarked and others based on when it's actually received. So it's a very scary time to be filing petitions over these next couple of days around April 1st. Um, and we'll have to see if there's an injunction that stops it anyway, so we go back to what we're doing right now. Okay, um, well, that doesn't look, are, you, is, is, are we trying to tell April 1st is April Fool's Day only? <laughs> it seems like it, but unfortunately, no. Okay, let's go to, um, well, um, what, what do you expect? To, what are the probabilities this time, Emily, uh, for, the, uh, for the people who are in the master's? How many applicants, total applicants might have been received? Last time, it's almost like 700,000. How many applicants do you expect this time? Yeah, I'm still thinking around 400,000 um, individual applicants, and then that's going to maybe give us, what, 25-30% chance of selection. So still not great, but definitely better than last year. Um, you know, we're still seeing people kind of filing with companies that they really shouldn't be, um, paying companies to submit their name in the lottery. Uh, companies that don't have a valid job offer that aren't even really operating. 
Uh, so I think that um, is unfortunately still a problem, even with this new system of the beneficiary centric process. Okay, let's go to the next stop, uh, pick Emily. Uh, and um, when, when do you expect the results to come? I'm sorry to ask this question. Um, so I'm expecting them this Friday, a couple days from now, possibly even Thursday. For some reason, I have stuck in my mind last year that uh, they started coming out a little earlier on Thursday than we expected. We thought normally they come on Friday. So I'm thinking the same this year. So we should have an update uh, by Monday of everyone that's been selected. Typically they come in bursts and batches over the weekend and then it's done on Monday and then we'll get an announcement from USCIS telling us officially they've sent out all the notifications and then even weeks later, we might finally get an announcement about how many registrations were actually received and how many were selected. Okay, let's back, go, go back to the discussion and lead to EB2 filing, uh, EB2 where the prior date is backed off all the way to 2011 ending. And as some of the people are been waiting in line, I've seen some people crossing the lines or cutting the lines. Um, seems to be that they are trying to go outside the country, work as a executive manager and come back and putting the date from EB2 to EB3. Uh, fortunately, we have seen a success rate from uh, of EB1C success a little bit more higher than the previous administration. Um, what exactly is involved in? Let's say, for example, I am an EB2. My priority date is 2018. And if I want to claim the EB1C, I know the rules that I have to work for a company outside the country and for the same or uh, company, uh, I have to work in the USA. That means I have to go outside the company, outside the country, work for that company. Let's say I work for, I work for Cognizant in India for a period of one year and as an executive manager there or high level manager there. And can I can come back into United States and work at a higher level manager here in the United States for the same company, and that company can file an EB1C application. We're seeing a lot of success rate. Can you tell me how the process will work? What are the things which sometimes don't work? How the uh, uh, sometimes don't work, Emily? Yeah, so um, first you need to make sure that there's a qualifying relationship between the company that you will work for abroad and the company that will eventually sponsor the EB1C green card in the US. So that means the companies have to be parent and subsidiary or affiliates um, in order to make that work. They've got to have that relationship. And then we're going to look at um, has the US company been doing business for at least one year? Do they have the ability to pay the wage offered as a manager? And then was your position or is your position outside the US meeting the definition of manager? Um, it is a very specific definition, so they don't look at title alone. Just because you're called a manager doesn't mean you're an actual manager for EB1C. Um, they need to see that uh, you are managing a department or um, a team or some part of the organization that you are functioning at a high level and have a high level of authority and discretion over the day-to-day -day operations of your team. They want to see that you have the ability to hire, fire, pay, and supervise the um, people that are reporting to you. Um, and so they're going to look at the organizational chart to see where your position is falling, who you report to, how many people report to you. They're going to want to see if you're a first line supervisor, they want to see that the people reporting to you are professionals. So they're, they need to have a, a, be in roles that require a bachelor's degree. And sometimes you even need to submit all of your supported bachelor's degree. Um, it's a lot of documentation because they don't just take your word for it. It's more than just submitting a letter explaining these things. Usually we have to submit an organizational chart that's supported by um, proof that those employees are listed on the organizational chart are employed by the company proof that you've been employed by the company, pay statements for one year, um, the subordinates um, job descriptions sometimes, their education documents, and then proof that you're actually managing. So again, it's not just about the job duties. They want to see you actually proof of you doing those job duties. So email communications is very common to submit showing you 
giving feedback, managing your direct report, um, performance reviews that you've conducted while you are a manager of those direct reports, um, you hiring people, you firing people, you approving leaves and approving vacation time and approving salary increases. Um, all of that is generally required to be submitted. Um, and then the US company has to also be offering you a managerial position. And again, they've got to prove that all of the requirements are met. So if you're not yet in the US position, they've got to at least provide the organizational chart with the um, proof the employees are working and proof of their education, typically. Um, if you're already back in the US in that role, they'll want to see performance reviews again, email communications showing you exercising your managerial discretion. Um, and then the, the um, proof that the US company has been doing business for at least one year, as well as proof that they have the ability to pay. So that's going to be company tax returns or a letter from the CFO of the company if they're larger. Um, so yeah, it's quite a lot of documentation. Uh, again, you, you have to physically work outside the US in that managerial role for at least one full year. You could, once you hit that point, you could have the US company directly file the I-140 petition. You technically don't need to be back in the US for that. They just have to be offering you that role in the US. Um, or you can come back on H-1B. You could come on L, L-1A. Um, if you have not used up all of your time and then have the company proceed to file the I-140 petition while you're in the U.S. You could, if your priority date would be current in EB-1 because you're porting your date, you could also file the 485 along with it if you're back in the U.S. by then. So it's definitely a process. It's not going to work for everyone, um, but it is a way to get ahead in the current visa backlog situation. Uh, the most cautious thing that I want people to understand is that is your company going to cooperate with you in all these steps what Emily has pointed out. Now, if they are not going to cooperate, who wants to come back, then you cannot file an EB1C by yourself. That's one major drawback that we see when people come back, the company is not willing to file the EB1C application. Um, a couple of questions that probably pop up in this one is that uh, let's just assume that by any chance EB1C fails, what will happen? Well, you can always come back to the United States on H1B at any point of time. Your priority date for EB2 will remain as it is. Of course, you may have to file a labor and I-140 with a new company you're going to join. Or if you join the old company, you can use the same labor and I-140 eventually for you to get the green card. Uh, so a lot of people right now are planning to do this EB1C, especially because the EB-2 is not expected to move uh, for a long period of time, especially if your priority date is 2016, 2017, 2018, it's going to take a long, long, long time for you to get the green card. So they are taking this path. Um, it's a little bit risk, definitely there is a risk, but the reward is too big to ignore because the risk is that if you go and something fails, uh, it takes, you know, for you to uproot yourself, take you back to your home country or some other country and stay there for one year and come back, definitely it's a lot of pain for you to do that thing. But the gain is that you're going to get the green card. Um, the porting of the date from EB2 to EB1 is almost automatic. I mean, we don't have to do, lawyers don't have to do a lot of creative arguments. All the things what Emily said, no, nah, we don't need to do anything. We just have to give them the I-140 approval and tell them to port the date and they automatically bid. It's a mandatory that they will have to give the porting from EB2 to EB1. Uh, I see some of the questions. Some people were asking if the priority date is going to become current for EB1, especially for Indian nationals, very unlikely. Uh, one of the main reasons why it seems that it's not going to become current is for EB1C is because there are a lot of people who are cutting the lines. What, are, what do I mean by cutting the lines? The people who have been waiting for the priority date to become current in EB2 or EB3, they are going outside the country, spending one year and coming back and claiming their EB2 priority date and getting the EB1C approval. So that is what I mean by cutting the line. And these people, the, there's been a very much increase in the people who are doing it. And that's one of the reasons where I'm not expecting the priority date to become completely current, at least in the near future, under the current circumstances we have right now. Anything else, Emily, before we go to the next topic? Nope, I think we can move on to changing status to B2. You know, 
back in the day, that wasn't even an option for someone who lost their job on H-1B. So how is that possible to do now? How is it working? Uh, USCIS has issued uh, uh, recommendations for the people who are losing jobs somewhere around March of 2023, where if you're losing the job, you can move to B2 application. And while the B2 application is pending, if you want, if you get a job opportunity, you can change back to the H-1B and they will approve the H-1B with the I-94. Now, before March of 2023, the way it used to work was that if you apply for the B-2, they would not grant the change of status from B-2 to H-1B. They, uh, 90%, 95% of the time, you will have to go outside the country and maybe if his stamping expired, you have to get the stamping done and come back into the country. That used to be a lot of pain for the people. The reason is that um, let's say you, you lost the job in April of 2023, you apply for the B2 application after four, uh, four or five months, you get the job and you want to change the status into the United States. You could not have done that, but for the uh, indication given by the USCIS on the website. So, uh, and that would have been a big pain for you to go and get the stamping outside the country and come back. Your employer may not want to wait for that too long for you to go and get the stamping, especially stamping previously used to take almost one year. It is almost taking about four months right now, but still the employers are not willing to wait. But right now with this new transition where the USCIS has indicated that we can move from B2 to H1B, a lot of people have opted the B2 option. A lot of people have changed back to H1B when they got the job, I have no issues, none whatsoever at all. And if anybody has lost a job and they want to move to B2, you can consult an immigration lawyer, especially our, our law firm helps us to almost file the application by yourself online, where we guide everything, including the statements, what documents need to be done, uh, our law firm, and there are other law firms that do that too. You may want to do converting to B2 and then convert back into H1B. So a lot of people are doing, a lot of people have converted to B2, B2 to H1B has no issues as of now, since the time of March of 2023. The difficulties were before March of 2023, we had some difficulties, but after March of 2023, we never had any difficulties moving to B2 and moving back to H1B from B2. People ask this question, oh, do I have to go through the lottery? No, if you have been countered toward the H1B lottery and you have not used up six years of H1B, you can come back into H1B from B2, absolutely not a problem. And if you have an I, some people ask me a question, if I have an I-140 approval, can I still file a B2 because it's a temporary intent? I had no issues filing the B2, I had no issues getting the approval of B2, I had no issues moving back to H1B, even if you have an I-140 approval uh, uh, since March of 2023. Anything else, Tamsin, yeah, before we get the questions? The biggest issue I've had with those cases is when the new employer is not familiar with this update and they're telling people, I can't file this as a change of status. You need to go for visa stamping. I'm only going to do consular processing. Um, so I've run across that a few times, but that is not correct. Hopefully they can be um, educated on that. Uh, because it, it doesn't make any sense for the company to go through that whole process and then do consular processing and have to wait for you to get the visa stamp and come back. And what if you get a 221G? What if you can't get an appointment and all those things? Uh, the companies definitely need to be educated on the, the, the uh, benefit to be able to file the change of status back to H-1B without leaving the country. Well, you can tell them to follow our YouTube channel. They'll get the education because from March 2023 onwards, we've been announcing this for a long period of time. Let's go to the question and answers. This question comes from the ex, uh, I mean, in the Twitter. Can I travel to India while my I-140 process, um, assuming that you're traveling on either H-1B or L-1 or H-4 or L-2, I have no problem. While the I-140 is pending, you can travel, will not have any problem, none whatsoever at all. This question comes from the name, the villain. Uh, Krishna from YouTube says, are the increased fees the same for H-1B transfers with premium? Is it also 11,000? Yes, but a few caveats here. Um, the company um, may have to pay the $4,000 fee if they have more than 50 employees and more than 50% of those employees are H or L. So if they don't fall into that category, you can subtract $4,000 from that fee. Uh, so it's still $7,000. Um, and also, if they have fewer than 25 employees, 
the fifteen hundred dollar fee reduces to seven fifty. The six hundred dollar fee reduces to three hundred. So it's a little bit better. Um, and again, this is with the premium processing. So yeah, it is still that expensive for every single transfer, even extension. Someone had asked about what's the cost for filing an extension. Um, the only thing that goes away with an extension is the $500 fraud fee doesn't have to be paid. And then on your second extension with the same company, then you subtract the $1,500 Acquia fee. Um, but still the um, $600 asylum fee is there. The premium processing fee is still there. Um, Viraj is planning to go for stamping in Mexico. Um, and if by any chance the stamping, they get a 2201G, can they come back using the automatic revalidation? No, no, no. The automatic revalidation is not applicable if you go to stamping in Mexico and Canada. Not applicable, clearly no. You will be stuck there if by any chance you get the 221G. You cannot come back into the United States using automatic revalidation. Um, let's see here. P. Varma says, when can we expect the lottery results? Until when can we expect lottery results to be coming in? What is the absolute last date based on prior year results? Well, technically, the absolute last date is whenever USCIS finally makes the announcement. Um, but our experience is we should get all of the notifications by Monday, April 1st. Um, that's been in 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. That's been pretty steady. Um, Kiran is asking question, can I file I-485 in the locations where the processing time is nine months? Uh, I think so what you're speaking about is the district processing times. Uh, no. You have to only file the applications based on where you're located at and in only service centers, but not in the district offices anyway, though. So uh, so you can't file based on wherever you want to. Uh, Sukhan says, how easy is it to apply for a compelling circumstances EAD in the case of being laid off? Can we apply online? Do we need to use a lawyer? And what are the success rates like? So. The layoff alone is not sufficient to qualify someone for the compelling circumstances EAD. There have to be additional factors that go with that, which there almost always are those additional factors like you're laid off and you have a mortgage to pay. You're laid off and you have kids in school that have private school tuition or you have daycare to pay for. You have U.S. citizen kids or things like that. So there has to be additional things in addition to just the layoff itself. Um, I cannot speak to online filing for it. I'm not sure if that category is available. Lawyers can't use the online system for filing the 765. I can't tell you anything about that. Um, the sec success rate really varies. I think uh, when it first came out and for the first couple of years, there were, were a lot of people that were not successful because they were only using the layoff itself as the um, explanation of the compelling circumstances. USCIS did later come out with some guidance that explained what you could submit to prove those compelling circumstances. Those are documents that our team has been submitting all along. So we were having very good success rates um, all along. But I think generally there there are good success. Um, I would definitely caution that this a lot of times is the very last resort, not the first resort in that situation because you're going to lose your non-immigrant status, which means when you do get that new job offer or when you are trying to get back to H-1B, the only way to do it is to exit the U.S. and consular process an H-1B petition. Now, it doesn't have to go through the lottery, but that's an extra step that if you had filed a change of status to B-2 or a change of status to H-4 or something like that, um, you don't have to do. So um, the and, and we would only really do it in the event of the 60 day grace period getting cut short because the I-94 is expiring or maybe there's just not enough time, things like that. So be uh, be aware of that is not the greatest option. Raj is asking the question for H-1B stamping, is it better go to India or to Mexico? Well, there are some advantages in going to Mexico, uh, especially the time. So you may get an appointment faster than compared to going to India. There are some advantages to go to India, uh, especially, uh, you know, if you get stuck, you know, you get stuck in India rather than getting stuck in Mexico. Um, those are the main advantages and disadvantages. 
but normally i tell the people that if it's, everything is clean nice and good you can go to mexico but if there is any little bit shady thing or not you know it's just controversial things so not that any bad things i normally recommend them to go to india rather than to go to mexico uh, Venkat and a couple of other people were asking about EAD AP renewals with the new fee structure. So some good news on that. If you already filed your 485 and it's pending before April 1st, um, whenever you have to do those EAD and AP renewals, they're still free. There's no filing fee for those. The filing fee, the separate filing fee for EAD AP only kicks in for people who file before 85 on or after April 1st, and then they have to pay those extra fees, which are a little bit confusing because the um, 765, if you file it along with the 485 on or after April 1st, is only $260 only um, instead of the normal $520. Um, but if you file the 765 separately from the 485, then it's $520. And then the uh, AP I-131 is $630. And there's no reduction in fee if you're filing that concurrently with the 485, which really doesn't make much sense. Uh, for, uh, for the EOS uh, pending for a long time with your priority date is current though, you can drop an email to Stephen at rnlawgroup.com. He gives a free consultation. He is the head of the uh, our law firm uh, for the litigation. Just drop an email to Stephen at rnlawgroup.com. Make sure you include you, when you file the 485 and your prior to date is current or not. Please mention whether your prior to date is current or not, and then send an email. And he responds very quickly, and then he will speak with you and guide you and tell the what the possibilities for the fee structure. You speak with him directly. Um, uh, Menik says perm is filed in June, 2023, expecting approval in July or September, 2024. Can I file the H1B extension in July, 2024 and file the H4 EAD for my spouse, um, under AC 21 in the same package in premium. So if you, so there's two ways the spouse can qualify for the H4 EAD. One is if you are filing a seventh year extension of your H-1B, and the other is if you have the I-140 approval. So I'm not sure if this extension that you're filing in July 2024 is a seventh year H-1B. Um, if it's not, then you need to wait for the I-140 to be approved and then file the H-4 EAD separately. Uh Ramba has this question. If somebody is laid off in the February 1st, but their payroll kept running until March 29th, when does the grace period start? We, along with a lot of other lawyers, have argued that your 60 days starts on March 29th, the date that your paycheck ended, not the day you got laid off. I know that you don't have access to the computer, you're not working, but we have argued that it's March 29th and every time we and other lawyers also we have been successful and without any problem. Krishna has this question that uh, his firm is pending and if he moves from F1 to H4, will it create any problem for the firm approval? The answer is no, it will not cause any problem whatsoever at all for your palm if you move from F1 to H4. And so this same thing is applicable when people are going out for six years, they're exceeding their six years and palm is not approved. Uh, can they move to H4? Will the palm will be denied? No, just because you move from H1B to H4, the palm will not be denied. But however, that your company has to be cooperative and want to continue with the palm labor, even though in, in the scenarios where you are not working for the company, they want to continue that you need to take care of it. Question from Max comes in. Um, he filed his 485 application. The company has never given him the I-140 approval or the plan. Um, and for the AC-21, if he has to move out of the company, does he need the labor and I-140 approval? Now, we normally request people to have the labor and I-140 approval, but if you don't have it, if you can guess what profession you are, which I don't think so, that's very hard for you to guess, you don't need your I-140 approval and the palm labor to file the AC-21 to move to a different company. 
Um, we are also not recommending people to file a I-485J, also called, also another word for it is AC-21. If you just move out from one company to another company, as long as your I-140 is approved and it's been more than 180 days that you've been pending with adjustment of status. Now, having said that, there is a way where you can get a labor and I-140 approval. It's free of charge. It's called FOIA USCIS, Freedom of Information Act USCIS. You can type it, there is a form, you can fill it out online, no fees for it. Once you fill it out, it takes approximately six weeks for the immigration to email you the, uh, they will send you the uh, form and I-140 approval when you request for it. It's very easy. It takes only 10 minutes for you. It's free, it's online. Go ahead, do it irrespective. Your company won't even come to know that you filed the request and you got the labor and I-140. Because USCIS does not inform the employer, hey, your employee has filed for this application. They don't do that. Yashvan says, my current H-1 visa expires in the month of October 2024. Can I travel to India and return to the U.S. in the month of August 2024? So I'm assuming that you have the visa stamp in your passport, the H-1B visa stamp, that's good till October 2024, along with your I-797 approval notice, that has an I-94 that's good till October 2024, and you're working for that company under the same terms and conditions mentioned in your H-1B. In that case, yes, you can come into the U.S. in August, even though your visa is expiring in October. Um, your visa and petition are valid up until the day they expire to allow you to enter the U.S. Um, I do generally recommend people traveling in that situation. Um, normally to carry an employment verification letter and from their company. And in that letter, the company should specify that they intend to file the renewal of the H-1B as soon as you return to the U.S. I've never had a problem with that. Um, what's the extension fees for, for the H-1B? Well, extension fees is quite different than the new H-1B application. Extension fee is quite lower than 11K, I would say very lower than. It de depends on the number of employees also, so we can't give the exact until we know the number of employees. Uh, can you travel? Uh, can you travel on a cruise from LA to Mexico and back on June second to June eighth? My STEM OPT extension expires in July two thousand twenty four. My F one visa expires in August two thousand twenty four. Two thousand twenty four. Will I have any immigration issues? No, I don't, you will have no problem. You'll be fine if you travel in June and come back, you will have no problem. You'll, you'll be fine to come back, Judy. Um, Parikh says, I have uh, H4, but if I travel, I traveled to India and came back on my old H4 visa and got an I-94 based on the old H4. Uh, what should I do? Should I cross the border? Should I do uh, stay for a day in Mexico? Uh, so yeah, this is very common um, that they give you the shortened I-94 either because you're coming back on a old visa stamp or your passport is expiring before your I-797 petition is expiring. So the first question is, has that I-94 expired yet? If it has, then you need to talk to a qualified immigration attorney to, to understand what your options are. But if it has not, um, then you have options. You can file an H-4 extension with USCIS, um, even though you've already filed one. You could travel uh, and come back in again if you go to your home country. If your stamp's expired, you'll need a new stamp. You could potentially go to Canada or Mexico and use automatic visa revalidation, which allows you to use your expired visa stamp um, with your new I-94 that um, extends your status to return to the U.S. without going for stamping as long as your trip was for less than 30 days and you did not apply for a visa stamp. Eagle has this question that he filed the POM application and uh, his uh, POM, then he will be applying for e, EB3 visa. Now I'm a bit confused. Is it E3 visa or EB3 visa? I would like to bring my girlfriend to the U.S. Uh, what is the best and fastest way? You may want to wait if, if, if it's an E3 visa now, uh, I would recommend that before the I-140 has been filed, I would rather want you to bring, get married and bring your uh, wife on e, uh, E3 dependent. Uh, that would be the best thing because once they find out that you filed an I-140 application, that may cause a problem 
in getting the E3 dependent visa. So I would recommend that before the perm is approved, you get your, uh, you get married and bring your uh, fiancé, uh, you know, make a wife and bring it to this country. That would be the best recommendation, I would say. Uh, Enerud says, my spouse's perm was filed last May, and I'm seeing 380-day wait time for uh, the processing time. Could you shed more information on the timelines, please? Yeah, that is accurate, unfortunately. Uh, it is taking one year or more for perm labor certifications to be processed. We actually have a lawsuit pending on that, and we're about to file another lawsuit. Um, so if you want to join the new lawsuit, um, your spouse would be able to, based on when that perm was filed, I would recommend reaching out to Stephen Brown, Stephen at rnlawgroup.com, um, to learn whether you want to join that lawsuit. Um, uh, uh, you did mention switching B2. This question comes from Kunal, Kunal B2 Visa. Uh, if a person get laid back and written back to H1B, is this applicable for the GCEAD as well? No, no, no. Because if you apply for the B2, you practically are giving up your 485 application. Not at all. There are other options for the people who get laid off on the GCEAD, assuming that you are the main applicant. Um, there self-employment is available. A lot of other options are available. You can contact a competent immigration lawyer. Um, they will guide you the process. But B2 is not an option for the people who file the 485 because you don't want to give up the 485 application completely. Uh, Viraj wants to know, can I use the AP to travel to any country? Should we always justify an emergency situation to travel using AP? Well, I'm assuming you're talking about an AP that's based on a pending employment-based 485. In that situation, you don't have to give any reason why you're asking for the AP. We just file it along with the 485 and you're eligible for it simply because you have a pending 485. You don't need to justify it. Um, pretty much anyone with a 485 in employment base needs to travel at some point. Um, so yeah, you can travel anywhere using that. Well, the AP allows you to get back into the US. You need to make sure you have the right documents to get to whatever country you're trying to get to. Um, but yeah, you can use it to go on vacation to any other country and then return on the AP. I have an I-140 approval. Can I move to F1 visa, H1 to F1, and back to H1B? Would I be cap exempt? Assuming that you're, you know, you already counted toward the H1B. Uh, no, you don't have to go through the cap again. You are cap exempt. Or uh, you can move to F1 and you can come back to H1B. We have seen a lot of people uh, doing that, uh, where people have an I-140 approval, they move to F1 and move back to H1B. We didn't notice much problem for the people who have an I-142. Uh, Kieran says, can we file the 485 in certain locations where the processing time is only nine months um, under cross-chargeability for oh, Idaho, for example, is only nine months to get the 485 approved? No, unfortunately, um, you file it based on the filing direct filing address of charts. Um, if it's just a standalone 485, that means you're filing at a lockbox and it's mostly going to end up at the National Benefit Center and then they decide whether they're going to send it to the field office or not, if you need an interview or not. Um, if you're filing it along with an I-140, then it's usually going to a service center um, and that service center may um, send it eventually to the National Benefit Center, but there's nothing we can do to uh, pick where the 485 ends up, unfortunately. Rajesh has an interesting question. He is interested in filing an EB-5, but wanting to look for a trusted company that he can invest, will be able to guide. There are some limitations, Rajesh, where, what we can guide, because we are not professionals in investment. We are just lawyers, though. Um, in general, I would just tell you, though, that EB-5 investment definitely is a very risky investment because the government wants to us to invest in places where normally U.S. citizens don't invest. That's the way I believe in. But there are some experts that we can suggest where you can go to uh, that can guide you what are better companies. But as such, we are not financial advisors. Uh, Ready and Living Peace is not a financial advisor. But contact Stephen Brown. He can suggest some of the people who are financial experts who can guide you uh, to go to the trusted uh, EB-5 investment. He will not do it, but he will suggest somebody else. 
Um, Idra says, can I continue working on the H-1B if it's expired and the extension is still pending in regular process? So as long as the H-1B renewal is timely filed, meaning it was received by USCIS before the current H-1B expires, you are allowed to stay in the country the entire time that the application is pending, and you can keep working for up to 240 days after your H-1B is expired based on the pending extension. Uh, can L-1B holders switch to H-4 plus EAD in the same renewal application of H-1B spouse who has an I-140 approval? Absolutely, you can. Uh, not only that, um, uh, your spouse, you can attach the H-4 and EAD along with your wife's H-1B. Your H-4 and EAD will be approved along with your wife's H-1B approval. It will be coming with H-1B approval. H4 and EAD will be coming at the same time. Yeah, you are an L1B, that's fine. That won't make any difference. You can convert into H4 plus EAD. Absolutely not a problem. VTV says, if a 221G is issued, can I transfer to a new company? Yes, um, it's not technically a transfer because you're outside the U.S., but a new company can file the H-1B petition requesting consular processing. And then once that's approved, you can apply for a new visa stamp. However, you may end up getting another 221G, and this really depends on the reason for the previous 221G. If it was something due to the company, um, then maybe you won't get another 221G, or if you do, it won't last as long. But if it's something based on your background, then you're just going to end up with another 221G as well. Uh, can you file AB1C for people in India who have worked in manager role in U.S. earlier in H-1B? Well, Rajesh, you must work first in India, and then you have to, the role has to be first you worked in India, and then you have to work, you have the role here in USA. If you qualify for both and it's the same company, then you will be eligible for the AB1C. Um. Harisha, it says, regarding the delays in AP, I've been waiting since July 2023. What are my options? The online message says that I can't initiate an inquiry since it's still within normal processing times. Um, yeah, your only options are to request an expedite, which most of the time USCIS denies in their discretion because they don't have the manpower to do that. The next option is to file a lawsuit, and we are seeing very good success with that. Um, for these types of interim benefits delays. Uh, so you can reach out to Stephen Brown if you are interested in that at stephen at rnlawgroup.com. Uh, can I stay in USA if my change of status of H4 is, uh, is in process or do I need to get it approved? This question from, from, comes from Krishna Wamsley. You can stay in USA if you apply for the H4 change of status. You don't have to get an approval before the expiration of your current uh, visa status. So you just need to file it before your current status, status expires. Um, Sir Chasm says, can an L1 holder switch to H4 and H4 EAD during the spouse's renewal application for their H1B if they have an approved I-140? Yes, so I'm assuming the H-1B holder has an approved I-140 and they're filing their extension with their company. You can include a change of status to H-4 and an H-4 EAD application along with that. Um, and if they're filed in premium processing, they generally are all three approved together. Um, Yogis is asking, when do you expect the lottery result? Uh, can I do consular processing because I have 23 months of OPT left? Uh, lottery results are expected by end of this week, at the most by Monday, Yogesh. We do not advise, we do not advise people to do in the consular processing. Please don't try to save money on the taxes. So I know that you get some benefits and taxes and your employer will push you very much because he doesn't have to pay the social security, but it is not in your best interest, your guest, to file in the consular processing. The reason is that if you file the consular processing, you get the H-1B approval. Technically, you're not counted toward the H-1B number. When are you counted toward the H-1B number? Two scenarios you are counted. First, you have to get selected, but there is a second condition that has to fulfill. 
you must get the H1B approval with the I-94. That means change of status approved. Then you are counted toward the H1B number. Since you are filing in the council processing, you are not counted toward the H1B number. The second option is that you got the council processing approved and you get the H1B stamping in your passport. Since you may get the council processing approved, but you're not getting the passport stamped, uh, the visa stamp in the passport, you're not counted toward the H1B. Only when you go and get the stamping, then you're counted toward H1B. What happens? You want to wait for two years and you, since you have about 29 months left on it, and then you wait for two, 23, you have 23 months. Let's say you wait for 20 months. What if in these 20 months you lose the job? That is a problem. Then you have to go to the lottery again. My recommendation to everybody, if you are in USA, unless there are some extreme circumstances which your lawyer advised to, please do not offer constant processing. Go for change of status. That money is not worth, believe me on that, Yugesh. Don't go for constant processing. Uh, Gannison says, recently moved to a new company and the I-485 porting was submitted, got the receipt notice. What are the next steps? Um, usually nothing. <laughs> um, it's very rare for us to get an I-485J approval notice unless your priority date is current and they're actually adjudicating your 485. So you will likely see nothing until your date is current or about to become current at that point. You might get an RFE asking again for a supplement, J. You might get an RFE asking for a new medical. Um, you might get an interview or you might get an approval. Emily, I have one question coming from Dropbox person. But it's a little bit controversial question, but I answer those questions. Please correct me in there. Can I bring my cousin on B1, B2 visa? And he has an approved H1B application. He may convert from B B2 to uh, B2 to H1B. Will it be a legal problem because I sponsor? My answer to that question is yes, it will be a legal problem. If you know your cousin is going to transfer from B2 to H1B and you are sponsoring him for B2 only to bring him to convert into H1B, that may be considered to be a fraudulent application. That may be considered that you are helping somebody to do an immigration fraud activity. Do stay away from it, though. If you have some any controversial people with you think so, they're going to do not illegal things. So do not sponsor them. We have a lot of situations where people have sponsored for B2 visas for distant cousins and they with the intention that they're going to come and work here illegally. It is going to create a problem for you. Anything, Emily, that you want to add on that? No, I agree with that. Uh, uh, it's a question. Be Sorry, go ahead. You Sorry. Go ahead. Um, is the new fee structure applicable for amendments as well if I were to change the client and work location? Yes, but um, there's fewer fees, so it's going to be $780 if it's just an amendment, not an amendment plus extension plus the $600 asylum fee or $300 asylum fee, depending on how big your company is, potentially plus the 2805 if you're doing premium processing. My son F1 visa says, end date is duration of status, till what date he will be under F1? Well, it's called duration of status. It could be any time until his duration of the F1. There are people that I know who have gone to universities for 10 plus years. Can a person be in F1 status for 10 plus years? Answer is yes. Uh, can, if he terminates the, if he terminates going to school or he's not an OPT or STEM extension, he's not on the student visa anymore though, then that means that he's no longer an F1. But yeah, there is no end date for F1. H1B has an end date. F1 has an, uh, uh, sorry, B2 has an end date. H4 has an end date. F1 does not have an end date. It can go to any unlimited time until the person completes the education. And if he's eligible for OPT and STEM extension, then he is uh, until that time that he completes the OPT and STEM extension. Uh, Shiva says, it's been three weeks since I submitted my EAD AP extension documents. 
but till now I've not received any confirmation or receipt number. Please advise. Yeah, we are seeing delays in receipt notices being issued, and that's one of the difficulties with EAD AP because there's no filing fee. You can't check to see whether the filing fee check has been cashed. So the only way you can follow up is by emailing the lockbox email address, but you have to wait 30 days for that, and then they take weeks to get back to you. Or call customer service, sit on hold forever if you can even talk to a live person and see if they're able to locate it. Um, and I expect those delays and receipt notices are going to get worse over the coming weeks because there's going to be a big rush to file before this April 1st fee increase. Not for the EAD AP for renewals because you don't have to pay more fees after April 1st, but everything else is going up. So all other applications are being rushed to be filed before Monday, which means we're going to see delays in all receipt notices. That's my expectation. So you may, all that to say, if you're really worried about it, just file it again um, because it's possible that it's been rejected and you won't know for a couple of weeks um, and there's no filing fee for it. Uh, all you have to get is new photos, so it's relatively easy to just file it again and avoid the delay. Uh, how long is the premium processing, uh, how long will the premium processing you take for the H1B new applications, assuming that I get selected in the lottery, this question comes from Juhi, are uh, typically taking about two to three weeks. That's the time that it's taking for the premium processing for the H1B. Um, okay. Second. Uh, advanced parole, uh, a lot of people are asking the questions, why is my advanced parole not getting approval along with the EAD when we filed it together? That's very common nowadays that people are not getting advanced parole along with the EAD. Uh, there is no solution for it, but it's taking, uh, not all people are getting com uh, combo card when you file it together. Um, SA says, my wife is working full time on H4 EAD. Can her company file PERM? Absolutely. You don't have to be only in H1B status to have a PERM filed on your behalf. You don't even have to be in the country to have a perm filed on your behalf. Um, so yeah, definitely you can do that. And then uh, Karen Shaw asking for a friend, the H1B forgot to renew his wife's H4 and they just had a newborn baby delivered this month. Is there any way they can establish her status again? Uh, they definitely should reach out to an immigration attorney, qualified attorney to talk about the idea of a nunk pro tunk extension. Um, there is precedent for uh, that situation when the application was forgotten. It does happen. Um, it's possible to be on the safe side. Uh, the friend's company can file an amendment, even if it's not necessary, amendment plus extension of his H-1B in premium processing, uh, include the H-4 extension with the nunk pro tunk request so that you can get the answer in two weeks. Because if you just file the H-4 extension nunk pro tunk, it may take longer than six months to get the um, answer on it. And you don't want her to exceed six months of unlawful presence from when the H-4 expired, because that can cause further problems for uh, getting the visa stamp and coming back or the green card in the future. Uh, Karancha has this question that one of his friend uh, That's filed. That's the one I just answered. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was not paying attention. Uh, question from some Kiran Reddy. Uh, my while H1B amendment is pending, can I travel to India and get stamped or already uh, on already approved H1B? No, uh, because your amendment is pending. Uh, you can't go for stamping with the already H1B because you're no longer working at that location or the client. So I recommend that you do premium processing H1B and after premium processing H1B, you can travel and get the stamping. Don't go while the H1B amendment is pending. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you everyone for joining today. We'll be back again next Tuesday at five o'clock central time to give you all the updates. Um, hopefully we'll be able to talk about H1B lottery results and give you an update on all the filing fee changes and any new updates that happen between now and then. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much.